The topic today, when I look at the cross, I thought that God had given me something more than I could actually put together when I started to think about this. But God is so gracious that he never challenges us more than he knows we can cope with. And I tell you, I needed his help every single step of the way with this one. This word has been brewing in my heart for some time and it goes back uh, following the time when Michael and Tini and Peter and Ushi were here and Phil spoke about, well it wasn't that his speaking, but he mentioned about the way that Jesus was flogged and flayed in the Passion of the Christ mm -hmm. film. I did communion that morning and it really struck me very much about what it was all about. And what I want to do is go through the aspects of the cross and how it means to me and how it means to you. It's a very emotive subject, it's a very personal subject, but it's also a subject which is covered quite well in the Bible as for what the purpose of the cross is. Also, when God gave me this word, the song, which we're going to sing a little bit later, which is Godfrey Bertel's When I Look at the Cross, kept going through my mind all the time. And so I took it as confirmation that God really wanted me to bring this message this morning. So I'd like to really start this word by asking you a question. What do you see or think about when you look at the cross. So, I then go on and ask, why was Jesus crucified on the cross? What does the world word reveal to us? What does the Lord say to us? There are several prophecies, can you Put up the PowerPoint, please. There are several prophecies in the Old Testament about the sacrifice of the Lord, or whom we know as Jesus. The crucifixion of Jesus fulfilled these prophecies. The first one is Isaiah 50, verse 6. I offered my back to those who beat me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mockery and spitting. And the whole of Isaiah 53 tells us a great deal of what to expect. The next verses are Zechariah 12 verse 10. Then I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the family of David and on the people of Jerusalem. They will look on me whom they have pierced and mourn for him as for an only son. They will grieve bitterly for him as for a firstborn son who has died. Zechariah 13 verse 7 says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, the man who is my partner, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Strike down the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And I will turn against the lambs. And finally, Deuteronomy 21, 23. The body must not remain hanging from the tree overnight. You must bury the body that same day, for anyone who is hung is cursed in the sight of God. In this way, you will prevent the defilement of the land the Lord your God is giving you as a special possession. In this verse, anyone who is hanged on a tree is described as cursed. The interpretation of the Hebrew word for tree can also mean pole or cross. So, Paul refers in Galatians 3.13 that this shows how the prophecy was fulfilled. And he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So 
So Jesus fulfilled Deuteronomy 21. And I think we can all see, and we're looking at hindsight here, aren't we? It's an amazing engineer hindsight. History, his story. Because that is what we are really learning about this morning. Maybe hundreds of years before the prophecies about Jesus' death came true 2,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. Psalm 22, verse 16. My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. An evil gang closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Just imagine going back to the day of Jesus' crucifixion at Golgotha. They were all around him, weren't they? They were mocking him. They would sort of say all sorts of things. And they also said, if you are God, you can come down from that cross. What they didn't realise is, of course, is that Jesus rose again. So he came down from that cross. But even then, David was being prophetic. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I cannot think of the pain of being nailed through the palms of my hands. I know Mel Gibson actually had it done to him as part of that film that he made. But then through your feet. Your feet are even more sensitive than your hands. You can pick up the slightest little bit of grain of sand, can't you, with the soles of your feet? Well, I think we can because we wear shoes, but the thing is, they are very, very sensitive. But I think from these prophetic words, we can actually recognise the elements of Jesus' death. His last few hours on, uh, as he hung on the cross. So... I think that you know Jesus and God or God was fulfilling those prophecies and it was his timing and his timing was perfect because the timing of Jesus' death was probably one of the worst times that the world has ever been in. The world was gone astray and how like we would look today and say how the world has gone astray or how we looked upon Sodom and Gomorrah and said the world has gone astray. But that timing of Jesus coming and being crucified was the pinnacle. Oh, how we need Jesus to return now because we feel we're there as well. Certainly what's going on in the world today. But no, we have to wait. So, why was Jesus put on a cross? Well, the first thing is, is that Jesus was classed as a criminal. Criminals in that day were hung on a cross as an example. And it didn't start with the, with the um, Romans, it started hundreds of years before. So they just carried on. But the thing is, is the way that the Romans did it. They were barbarous. They, were, they encouraged their soldiers to be barbarous, cruel. Because they took everything that they wanted by force. They took everything they wanted by subduing their enemies or those whom they wanted to conquer. And so it's not surprising, is it, that Jesus, because he was a criminal, and I'll go into that a little bit more in a moment, was crucified. The other reason is that crucifixion was obvious. It was very public and it was put always in prominent places to be a deterrent for other people so that they would not become criminals and be hung on the cross. So what was the crime that Jesus committed? And we, we can read all about it in the uh, Gospels. And really, is the main one is that Jesus was charged, and here it comes, with blasphemy. How can God, how can the Son of God be charged with blasphemy? But anyway, why was he charged with blasphemy? Because he claimed as being the Messiah and the King of the Jews. Now this is what other people said. 
Because Jesus didn't actually say, I am the Messiah. When he was questioned by Pontius Pilate, are you the Messiah? He said, it's as you say. So that was the only claim that Jesus made to being the Messiah. But that wasn't enough because the Sanhedrin, they were the legalistic and the uh, all the top elders of the Jewish faith sat there in court as being, we are God's appointed, we are the legal people who represent God in this country, in the world in fact they thought, and we have the say as to what goes. They were so legalistic about things that they never ever thought outside the box. So blasphemy it was to them. So they really wanted Jesus put to death. But of course the Sanhedrin didn't have the authority to put anybody to death. They had to take him to Pilate, who was the Roman governor. And even Pilate discussed it with Herod the king at the time. But Pilate could see nothing wrong, but he gave in. And so Jesus was crucified. But why was Jesus so brutally treated for a non-violent, trumped-up charge? History tells us, that I've just mentioned a moment ago, that the Romans were a barbaric race, and they actually wanted they you know the gladiatorial system and everything like that they loved blood sport and they encouraged their soldiers to be as horrible as vicious as any could be almost like a competition if you can do bad i can do worse if you can make somebody really cringe i can i can beat them to within an inch of their life and that is what they did they flogged him and they flayed him until he literally could have, the next blow might have killed him. But they had become so expert in their, what shall I say, in the way that they applied their brutality. A bit like torture as we hear of. They knew exactly when to stop. They could commit just as much brutality as they liked, but they knew when to stop, which is cool, cold and calculating. We know in the old, from the Old Testament that the ultimate sacrifice that God wanted was by the spilling of blood. Okay? And the animal, which we talked about a moment ago, had to be the perfect one. It was the white sheep. It was the perfect. And it, it couldn't have any, with any blemish or anything wrong with it at all. It had to be absolutely perfect and it was slaughtered. It was a blood sacrifice. And this was what got me that particular morning when I realized why Jesus was flogged with an inch of his life and blood. Because he was the Paschal lamb. He was the perfect lamb who was flogged within an inch of his life. His blood was shed. And I mean shed. It wasn't like any cross that you see in a lot of churches with just the wound in the side where the soldier went to see if he was still alive. He was flogged, he was shredded. And then he had a crown of thorns put on his head. And we all know what a crown of thorns looks like because you can see in the campo the particular thorny plants that were used. And those thorns were that long and they were as hard as nails. And it was forced on his head. So we know all about sacrifice. Leviticus 3, 1 to 17, tells us exactly how the sacrifice must be made. So a very bloody Jesus was crucified. And during Jesus' time upon the cross, many things happened which were prophesied in the Old Testament. But that's another word, another day. The Jewish priesthood thought it was all over once they hung Jesus upon the cross. <laughs> but we know it wasn't. It was the beginning. It was actually the beginning. It was the beginning of salvation of the world. 
but little did they know. I'm thankful that Jesus has died on that cross. So that is why when I look at the cross, it is so personal to me. So, let us look at the cross that is behind me. I've already said, my cross is empty, as indeed yours is. Whenever we go visiting churches here, magnificent as they are, they all have a Jesus still on the cross. Don't they realise Jesus ascended into heaven and the cross is empty? What is wrong with the church? I'll leave you to make your own mind up. <laughs> the other thing is that we know that Jesus now stands in honour at the right hand of God his Father. Some versions say sit. But it doesn't matter. If you read Acts 2-3 you'll have the same version and there are many many other mentions I could have filled a book it's called the Bible I'd like to quote a professor of the New Testament and biblical theology Patrick Schreiner he says the cross is not only where our sin is paid for where the devil is conquered but the shape of Christianity he also says wisdom was found not beyond the cross, not above the cross, not below the cross, but in the cross. And I was thinking about that and I thought, yeah, I, I couldn't really agree with that more. That encapsulates the whole of what the cross is about, and what Jesus was about, and what we are about. So, let us look further at what the cross represents. The new covenant. The death of Jesus on the cross was the start of the new covenant. Mike mentioned in his introduction to the communion this morning, the new covenant. We drink the blood of the new covenant. The blood of Jesus. Jesus said at the Last Supper, Mark 14, 24, this is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for many. So, I then had a big helping hand from God as to what we see when we look at the cross. And so I'm going to come through with quite a few others here. Now, as I said earlier, this is a very, very personal thing. This is what the Word of God says about it, but we can add to that. So, we have thankfulness. This, again, is a personal feeling, but I'm sure you are all thankful for the fact that Jesus died on the cross and then rose again. And so we look at an empty cross. Colossians 2, 7 says, Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Here's a biggie. The defeat of Satan. Colossians 2, 14 and 15. He cancelled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. This is why we say, bring all of your baggage to the foot of the cross and leave it there because Jesus took all of our sins and that's what our baggage is it's our sins it may not be that we've gone out and done something absolutely what we consider disastrous it could be just a small little drop in our eyes but to God sin is sin whatever it is so Take it to the foot of the cross and leave it. Now, I know that we all feel comfortable with the way we are very often, and that includes the sin that we sometimes carry. And that's why we need to leave it there and not pick it back up. And the reason that is, is because God will move us on. We take off the high heel shoes and we start to walk properly. 
we also will be taken into pastures new. We will be moved on by God because Jesus took our sins at the cross. He wants to take us somewhere new. I don't know about you, but I thought I didn't want to go anywhere after finishing here. But you know, I'm looking forward to whatever it is that God might have for us in the future. And I haven't a clue what that is. So the next one is radiance and glory of God. Hallelujah. Oh, bring on the radiance and glory of God. <laughs> Hebrews 1.3. The sun radiates God's own glory. Hallelujah. And expresses the very character of God. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honour at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. I'd like to go back. When he had cleansed us from our sins. Because that is what he wants to do. He doesn't want anybody to carry their sins with them at all. He doesn't want the world to carry their sins. But they have to make a decision themselves. We cannot make it for them. And here it is. Forgiveness of or cancelled sin. Wow. Thank you, Lord, that you died on that cross to forgive me of my sins. Galatians 5.24 Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. So our sins were crucified on the cross with Jesus because he took our curse. 1 Peter 2.24 He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds you are healed. This is incredible stuff, you know. It isn't the case of somebody spouting on the top of a hill saying, Oh, I can do this, I can do that. This is the truth. Because Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. Colossians 1.20 And through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. By Christ's blood on the cross. So if he hadn't had such a bloody death, that couldn't have been fulfilled. That could not have been achieved. He had to be flogged within an inch of his life. He had to shed his blood. Horrible as it may appear to us. But if he didn't, we couldn't come before him today and say, forgive us, Lord, in the same way. But here is a mighty one. Love. Romans 5 8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us. While we were still sinners. Could you send your son. To be crucified for others. Or any child or anybody. It's horrific isn't it. But you know God chose that way specifically. He chose that way. Because of the blood sacrifice. From the very beginning. When sacrifices were required. It was always blood. I thank God we no longer have to do that. I really, really do. I'm very glad that Jesus completed the task that he did. The promise of eternal life. Hallelujah. We have the promise of eternal life. Isn't that amazing? Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. So that was before, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So if you know and have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord, our sins are forgiven. Wow. Anybody that doesn't know him needs to get on their knees right now and say, Lord, forgive me. I want to know you. I want to accept you as my Lord and Saviour because I can then achieve that verse. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 to 55. 
In when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, and our mortal bodies have been transformed into immortal bodies, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Gone. Jean is now celebrating. She's got that promise of eternal life. Margaret has got that promise of eternal life. She's having a ball. They're having a ball. I presume, because I don't really know of what being. But the thing is, we are promised eternal life. When this goes, yeah, maybe not so many years now, but it, when it goes, I really, yeah, wow, <laughs> excitement. The power of God. The power of God was released. We can all say we've seen the power of God from time to time. Well, oh, the fact we've seen the power of God is we're sat here. Because God has spoken to us at some time in our life that you need to accept Jesus. That's the power of God, his Holy Spirit at work in us. 1 Corinthians 1.18 The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for, for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. So the first part of that verse applies to the world. It's how we were before we came to know the Lord Jesus. It applies to the world today. Probably, you could say, probably now more than ever. But bear in mind the previous sequences that I said about Sodom and Gomorrah and also uh, before Jesus was crucified. But there was also another time, wasn't there? We all know it as the Second World War. But the thing is, are we in that same situation today? And I'll leave you to judge that one for yourself. But this is the one, another one, another one that I'm thankful for when I look at the cross. Salvation. Without the cross, without Jesus dying upon that cross for us, salvation wouldn't exist. We wouldn't be saved from and achieve all the other things that we see through the cross. Galatians 5.11 Dear brothers and sisters, if I were still preaching that you must be circumcised, as some say I do, why am I still being persecuted? If I were no longer preaching salvation through the cross of Christ, no one would be offended. That's something to think about. If we don't go out there and tell the world about the cross, well, first of all, we're not doing our job. But the thing is, they wouldn't know. So they wouldn't be offended in any way, shape or form. But we are offended because we know the truth. We probably take offence quite quickly at times. But really, this shouldn't take offence because it's at God, not at us. We're just the messenger. And we all know the saying, don't shoot the messenger. But the thing is, when anybody throws any brickbats at you, or can I say, swears at you, or what some people say, curses you, it's at God, not at us. This is something we all look for. The peace of God. And even though we know the Lord Jesus, there are times when our peace is really disturbed. <laughs> we all have them, don't we? And when we look at it in hindsight, we think, well, why did I get in such a state about it? <coughs> When I could have done this, or I could have done that. But no, we get wrapped up in the moment and our peace is stolen. But remember that through the cross we have the peace of God. Ephesians 2.14 says, For Christ himself has brought peace to us. So if we believe in Jesus Christ, we have peace. Remind me, will you, in future? <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, he united the Gentiles and the Jews into one people. When? his own body on the cross. He broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He broke down the wall that separated us. The wall of hostility. What's at the heart of hostility very often? Anger. 
this so-and-so fiber is not working. You know, all it does is we get angry about things. We all have our moments, don't we? And that starts to separate us from the peace of God. So we need to say, calm down. It doesn't start till 6.30, for those who may remember the advert. But anyway, the thing is, is that God's peace is there for us because through the death of Jesus on the cross we receive God's peace all those who believe revelation that Jesus is God's son 1 John 5 6 and Jesus Christ was revealed as God's son by his baptism in water we spoke about earlier and by shedding his blood on the cross. Here's that word again, blood on the cross. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And the Spirit who is truth confirms it with his testimony. So much, isn't there? There really is. No wonder I struggled. Righteousness and God's grace. Romans 5.17 For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! Amen. Through the death of Jesus we receive all those items, don't we? Come on, we do, we do. Yeah, just believe it. Believe it. Sometimes the believing is the difficult part we have in our lives. You know, it was through total unselfish love that Jesus died on the cross. He bore our curses and all our sins. And for all those who accept him, we receive salvation and the promise of eternal life. But none of this would have happened without the humility of Jesus. Philippians 2, 7-8 Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus went before God the night that he was actually betrayed. And he said, Father, take this from me, but not my will, yours be done. Brave. Brave without compare. And as I bring this word to a conclusion, I just want you to think about how the Lord is demonstrating all the attributes of the cross that we've just gone through to each and every one of us, personally. But you know, as we have received these attributes, there's an expectation placed upon us by God that we will follow through. Not so easy, easily said, not so easily done. But I'll leave you with a final, well, almost a final slide and there's various other thoughts Colossians 3.12 since God chose you to be the holy people he loves you must clothe yourselves with tender hearted mercy kindness, humility, gentleness and patience do we? but when we look at the cross that is what we see and we will be singing in the song in a moment precisely what Godfrey Berger saw and sees. And I concur completely. I believe that the cross demonstrates to me what Jesus attributed me with. Indeed, all of us. I'm sure that there are many other things that you can think about that mean so much more to you in addition to what the word of God says about what the cross means. 
I hope that I've been able to share something of what the cross represents this morning. It hasn't been easy. In fact, it's very difficult, and I hope that I've done it justice. But the thing is, even if I haven't, I've got a mighty Father who will forgive me. All I can say is, I've done my best for the Lord. And if it's not enough, I'm sure he will forgive me. And he'll correct me later in private. Okay. <laughs> but the biggest thing is, is that it's because of God's forgiveness, mercy and grace, who loved us beyond compare and only wants the best for us, that we are here today. So I conclude by saying, Hallelujah. Thank you for the cross. Yeah.